Hello everyone, uh, this is Jacqueline Keeler. I'm just getting stuff together. I um, actually had um, an amazing amount of, oh God, I'm already, I'm still getting all these phone calls. Um, and um, and um, so it's, uh, I've done so many, I've interviewed so many native people over the last few days, telling me their stories, telling me what it's been like to live with this kind of exploitation in their communities and in their lives, of their lives. And I have listened to all of you and I have, um, and I will respect the anonymity of people who wish it and who wish to have themselves protected. And, and, uh, and it's, um, it's been an honor to hear your stories and, and, and how important the work I'm doing is to you right now. And, uh, and, uh, um, and, and, you know, I, I think uh, I actually, I wanted to feature, I, I still haven't figured how in this particular uh, window, uh, how to put my face back on there, but I will eventually, I've just been so busy. And uh, so, and I just, I'm running late today because I had gotten another phone call and you hear I have gotten another phone call. And so please do feel free to call me if you have, you know, your stories to tell about your experiences with different, uh, you know, um, exploiters in your community and and uh, we we will uh, definitely be you know we will follow all journalistic practices to protect you to to make sure you're heard and um, and to to investigate these stories right the, these things so uh, this podcast I, I I put on the I put on the flyer a photo um, of uh, of uh, they often call her is it Kala Shah but She's actually Yankton Sioux. She's from my dad's tribe. And my grandmother told me her name should be Zikana Shah because we use the in at the end of words in our dialect. And, um, and she, actually, uh, she actually is a relative of mine. Um, I don't know. And uh, she, uh, um, she actually lived with my, my, my dad's, my, the Keeler line of my family. Her and her mother moved into um, with our family in Greenwood when she was a girl. And uh, this is from like the Keeler side of my family. Uh, which is um, um, that we're related to her through those are how she's a cousin of mine. So um, anyway, I um, <clears throat> so yeah, I uh, so I'm gonna get and you notice the title is looking at the future um, structural fixes to pretendianism because I think that um, that is going to be uh, you know we you know going doing whack a mole as I called it going through pretendian after pretendian and uh, is 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 a lot of work as you can see I took on two this week and and that's you know I've gotten a huge amount of you know response from that if I can put that mildly response and uh, and, and and but I'm going to persevere and uh, and so we are going to continue looking at these things and um, actually I think uh, let me see here I wanted to actually um, See if I can bring this up here. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about. Is that coming up? Let's see. There it is. Yeah. Let's see if we can do this. I have these two pages up, and and um, one of them is actually uh, my my blog, Tioshbaya Now, which is named in uh, in in our language, in 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 my father's people's language, in Dakota. That means like. Tiyoshba means the circle of teepees. I think I have a quote on there from my great aunt. And it's about, it's a circle of teepees in which a family lived and in which they were safe, in which all good things would happen. You know, all the children were taken care of. And so I named my blog, this is, I've been having this for several years, and it basically is, you know, I want that now. I want that now for us, right? And you see, it's likely through her some of the articles I've written and some of the blogs, and and these are a lot of if, if you want to see the kind of work I've done, and this is more blogging work, although I do have links to my published articles in them. Um, you know, this is some of the ideas and kind of my history, my family history, um, and uh, and and I noticed that in some of the comments, people were like, "Well, you're you look white, right?" And I I can't say that anyone's ever said that to me before, um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, it's. You know, my, my father is 5 8 Dakota. He's an enrolled member of the Yankton Sioux tribe. My mother is full Navajo, right? And, uh, and, uh, and you know, my, all my grandparents were enrolled. Um, all, all my great-grandparents were enrolled. <laughs> we are members of the Native community. And, and I don't know, my, my skin color doesn't look like I think it should look on camera because of these lights and things. And 
Um, I guess I should just paint myself brown, huh? So I look more like what I'm supposed to look like. But my experiences and my identity is authentic. And I work very hard to present it authentically. And I work very hard to do, to do journalism, to, uh, to, to, to shine a light on uh, things and make life better for our people. And so, uh, and there's a lot of things that I have encountered over the years as a journalist that I've seen. And, and, you know, I think, um, you know, <laughs> I, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, I, I, I know that somehow, somehow I can take a stance and somehow I have, maybe I have that in me, right, to do that. And, and I know that, I, and I don't encourage other Navajo writers or people to come forward and take a stance and be knocked down. I will take that stand, you know, for, for you know, I will be the one. And, and not because I want to be, center myself, but because, you know, what's raining down when we stand up against pretendianism is really ugly. And it's really, it's, it's really quite, um, it's part of that, I don't know, I'm going to look at it from a structural point of view and a structural fix, right? But I am also looking at it, you know, in the sense of, um, of a, um, I guess it's, it's part of our, our worldview, our cosmology that we're fighting for, you know, and I think that that cosmology could stop climate change. That cosmology, you know, we have had cultural exchanges of ideas before, uh, in uh, with 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 the Europeans, right? And this led to you know world democracy, of course, which is actually you know is under threat with the pandemic. We've seen the rise of more authoritarian governments, right? Even here in this country, and um, and then we are also you know the icon the ideas of of feminism, of of women's rights, right? And so this is um, that's a thing I did about um, the. Uh, the election of two Native congresswomen, and um, and this is about Wounded Knee because my family were there at Wounded Knee, and so, um, but yeah, it's um, the original 1890 Wounded Knee, and that's about Navajo voting, and I mean, I these are all parts of my own family history, and me taking on Warren, a pretendian, that was interesting, and uh, so it's um, so I bring all this to my work, right, and I and I don't try to present myself as something or not. I saw someone criticizing me on. Twitter, um, a nameless um, uh, native writer saying that I was born in Ohio. Well, you know, I don't make the secret of that. My parents met there through relocation, the relocation program that was actually uh, meant to terminate our tribes. And they and 20,000 young native people were there in Cleveland. For the first time, there, had been, there were native people in Ohio after they had been driven out during after Tecumseh lost at Fallen Timbers in the early 1800s. And so, you know, yeah, that's, I'm a product of that. My parents would not have met otherwise, you know. And so, uh, so it's quite, um, so, so, you know, and I've written about it. I, I wrote, uh, in a, you can go to salon.com and I wrote a piece, which they titled, I didn't title, uh, My Life as a Cleveland Indian, right? Talking about the Cleveland mascot issue. And, and I've gone back to Cleveland and spoken there with the American community and they have embraced me like, like a child that they're like their child, do you know what I mean? And that was a very moving experience. You know, you don't think of native people being in Cleveland, but they're still there and, and they still have an American Indian community. And, and, you know, they really, you know, were really wonderful to my mom and me when we went back this past year. And then when I was there a couple of years earlier, they've been really wonderful. And so the, we have all these ties and, and our, our stories, our stories talk are, are, are deeply reflective of, of the challenges we face of, of, um, of, of, you know, policy and law, you know, and all of these things. And this is why, this is why we need authentic people speaking for us, people who have actually experienced those things. And actually, you know, I just, a young, uh, I just had um, um, a, um, a man call me and I have to preserve his anonymity, but um, with more information and, and, um, and I, uh, and he, you know, right before I went on the show, he, I have to say that he told me, he said to tell you all, that, uh, um, uh, cause he was, you know, he was like, what he, he said, what, I'm oh, sorry. Let me actually make sure I'm on, let me go back over here. Oops. Sorry. Actually, I'll just go here. So I can, talk. so what he said was, um, I'm not being, um, he said to tell you that we are just trying to get the bottom of this. What is the standard? You know, okay. There's no blood quantum. There's no rules. You know, um, you know, we um, and to tell you that I'm not being violent on this. I guess they're trying to say that I'm doing lateral violence by 
doing this and that this was brought forward by the community uh, why don't we do healing and and uh, and and why do we allow people to profit off of our suffering they have to have accountability right and and uh and then you know he uh you know he, you know he was the one using the term exploiters in his community right and um and, and i think that and he was talking about there's this historical background where we have had a lot of exploiters come into our communities and and if, if a person has if there is no blood quantum and if there is no enrollment well then what he was like why even call it an indigenous database do you know I mean because you know it, what what relevance does that have to anything you know and so and so i i, I have some ideas and um so uh so it's um I, I definitely have some ideas about how to address that and and i actually opened up um let me go back over so this one here let me actually look at this too i'll show you this um so I actually um, I opened up my Instagram and um, and here you see I have um, a, and if you want to know like what kind of work I'm doing and how I do it and where I'm at and all these different issues I cover and if you don't want to Google all my articles you can kind of see here like you know what I'm doing and what I'm up to and, and what I've done um, I have a little quote here thought woman is the only creator of thought and thought precedes creation and um, and so I thought that was a really great way of thinking how we think about the world. And of course, that is a specific culture, Laguna Pablo, Vicaris culture. And um, and so, yeah, so I basically, you know, I turned in my manuscript on Monday. I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> and so and um, and then here's a quote that I had from The New York Times. And these are some videos I did covering the protests on Portland in, in, here in Portland, Oregon, where I live, um, the Black Lives Matter protests. And, you know, I just I kind of show a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I mean, people are curious. And, and so if you ever want to know what I'm doing or, you know, this is, um, you know, here's a kind of fun photo of this is actually my grandmother here. And these are her older brothers. And this is her grandfather who was from France, you know. And so, you know, I'm not hiding. This is actually um, the book cover for my book that's coming out, Standoff. And it's Standing Rock and the Bundy Movement and the American Story of Occupation, Sovereignty, and the Fight for Sacred Lands. And I, I've kind of positioned to, to address why the Trump years happened, you know, why Trump. And so it'll be coming out in March. Here's an old article I wrote a long time ago about Grandma's Dolls versus Lara Croft. That was in the San Francisco Examiner. And, you know, I just, I've done a lot of work. And you can, if you want to know what that looks like, you know, here I am, you know, entering, this is a, articles I did when I went back to the Yankton Sioux Reservation, and this is the kind of flooding that took place. You know, you can see it all here. It's pretty clear what I do. Um, and, um, and so it's not hard to figure out the work I do. Here, here, we, here I was on the Navajo Nation, you know, in January doing reporting on the ground, you know. And so it's, you know, I, I do a lot of work. I don't just do pretendianism. Um, and then I, I wanted to actually, uh, this is actually a, the focus of our next pretendian episode, which is Matiwaya, and uh, and we're gonna. It's, this is a really cool history thing. I really loved learning about about it. And um, and here's you know a picture of uh, you know North American Indians in the Great War. My great grandpa Keeler and his twin brother are featured in this book. Um, um, they're Yankton Sioux and they fought in the World War One. And you know, and here's some things I shot while I was in on the Navajo Nation in December. Um, and, you know, so I, I, if you want to see what I'm doing and the work I'm kind of doing, you know, this is a really great book it's about my um, Yankton ancestors. All our Yankton ancestors were really fortunate to have that kind of book. So it's all there. I'm not hiding who I am or anything. I, I'm very clear about who I am. And I write from that perspective. And, um, and so um, here is me uh, with our when we were younger with my daughter, with our daughter, that's my husband. And yes, he is a white Indian. And so when I talk about white Indians, I'm talking about my own family, <laughs> you know. And so, uh, so he's at, he's has status at Six Nations, um, and his grandfather was um, was a chief there. And so, um, but you know, we all have our stories. We all have our connections to our culture. And I think you can get a pretty good overview of mine here. And if you ever want to know anything about me, this is actually um, my great. My great grandpa Henry Keeler's sister, Julia Keeler, uh, Drapo Flying Hawk. So, you know, I have, you know, my family's pretty well documented. It's not a hidden 
story or anything like that. This was um, great. I got to attend attend this. You know, it, but it's just you know, um, you, if you want to know, you can check it out. Um, but I really um, actually I'm gonna go back to. You. Um, so, but I really wanted to talk about um, particularly um, let's do a search there a little bit um, about about how we um, how we change this. You know, go back over here. How we how we change. Uh, I guess, how do we deal with pretendiness? And I also want to say that I will deal with a lot of the, the stuff that happened on like all the, the insanity of the backlash. I will deal with that in detail in an article that will be, um, I think, uh, in either in Pollination or in Tiosh Baya now. So definitely, um, you know, um, sign up there and you'll get alerted when that goes through. I will, I, yesterday I took time off to be with my family and, you know, we, we took a walk and we, we just, you know, we're, we're a very loving family. We're, and so we, um, and, um, and then we, um, and then I, uh, and so I think I will like process a lot of this and then I will think about it. You know, when you are being, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, when you bring these things forward, people sometimes don't want to have an honest discussion. They want to sort of, um, that some of what they do is simply strategy, you know, and I talked a bit about last time about making sure that we we do not play on the playing field they give us, right? The playing field they give us, we're meant to lose on. And so those are not honest discussions. Those are not discussions where they really want to understand what we're talking about. And so um, so I, I don't engage in that. And I, I, I think that I focus on, I focus on, I mean, what drives me to do this is that I, 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 I've seen how much suffering exploitation causes our people, right? And I'm going to call it, people don't like pretendianism, I'm going to call it exploitation. You know, I think that's a really great description of it. We're being exploited. And because that brings all the different definitions of colonialism and everything together. And, and our suffering is being exploited, right? And if there is no, if there is no, you know, standards, then anyone can be Indian, right? Anyone. And, and so what does it even mean? You know, it, it loses all meaning. And this is actually the purpose of, uh, of uh, this is the colonial purpose, right? To make us disappear politically. And then we have no, we have no, we can't challenge the taking of the land that has occurred. We can't challenge their domination. And so as imperfect as tribes are, and I'm not saying that I agree with blood quantum. I am not saying that I, uh, I agree with a lot of the structure that is there. Um, I am saying that we need structure, and just like any other nation has structure. And, um, and I, I'm going to talk you through a bit of the process, how I came to this idea. And, um, and I don't know if I'm going to use, and I will just, it's a working idea, and I encourage people uh, to contact me and to, uh, if they have, you know, other ideas and stuff, I think this is something that we should look at to stop exploitation, right? And because, uh, and so, I actually kind of came to this idea by working, well, from a number of sources, but one was really uh, covering the baby Veronica case in 2013, and uh, and it was it was it was horrible when she was taken away from her family, you know, with with you know armed marshals sent by uh, then uh, South Carolina Governor uh, Nikki Haley, who has now served um, as the UN ambassador under Trump, uh, and who herself is. Um, is uh, Indian American. Her parents are from India, and uh, and you know she had no respect for the Cherokee Nation sovereignty, right? And and uh, so as I was covering that issue, um, and I think I'm going to hold on a second. I'm going to uh, so I can, I'm going to try to um, let me see find this. Um, actually, let me. Um, Sorry, I was gonna. I wanted to just show you the whole thing first. I should have probably opened up um, two different. Um, let's see if it'll open up um, two different windows so I could have this other window available to you. So um, uh, let me see here. No, oh, that's not it. This is just some of them. Oh, here it is. This is the one here. So um, <laughs> this is kind of funny. This is the thing I wrote: Black Hills and Stone Boy: New Interpretations. I wrote that in college, and it's in terrible academic speak. So, but it seems very popular on the page. It gets like thousands of hits a year. So, um, let me see here. Okay, so this is a piece I wrote 
Uh, I wrote this back in 2013, August, almost exactly seven years ago. And, um, and I actually wrote this for Native News um, after the ruling, the Supreme Court ruling, where uh, baby Veronica was was going to the they was going to be taken from her from her family from her tribe and I should note that the Brown family her 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 Cherokee family were not found unfit there was no reason to take the child from them other than that the adoption um, system in this country what I learned as I spoke to more folks in it this the adoption system is a for profit system and when and they were they they didn't have enough babies because a lot of the other countries were shutting the doors on American out adoption because of because um, adoption if you don't like your adopted child you can rehome them you know like a pet and you can advertise and then people can get children that way and a lot of other countries were hearing reports about this and and so suddenly there weren't a lot of children available and so and there aren't any way anymore anyway because people don't um, give up their children as much anymore as they once did so I was told that in any given year, that there's like 11,000 adoptable children in the country, but the demand is more like 30,000. And so there's this huge need for kids. And so what they were doing uh, was that they were targeting veterans and their families. So when the when one of the family was overseas, they would kind of target the other, the mother or the other parents and try to get them to give up the child. And this is what happened in this case. And so anyway, um, so I, I wrote this op-ed and I really, and I was, you know, uh, Levi Rickert, the editor in chief of Native News, called me after the ruling, and he was like, he, I don't know if he's okay with me saying this, but he was in tears. He was so upset about it, and uh, and and so I wrote this as a way, and I titled it um, "Baby Veronica and Indian Sovereignty: Fifty Years After the March on Washington," and um, and you know, because this really was a referendum on Indian sovereignty and what it means. And, um, and so it was in this piece, actually, that I sort of came up with the idea. It really for forced me to examine certain elements, structural elements of our society reporting on this piece. And uh, one of them was the fact that, that the white couple, the Capibiancos, who actually uh, got custody of her, uh, they were actually, they, they had a PR firm. And that PR firm was funded by this Christian group, right? I think the name is inherent. This case me now. It's been you know seven years, and uh, and they uh, they were a couple in Montana. Uh, one of them was native. His, the husband and the wife was white, and it was a Christian group, and and they were really promoting this idea. And I think they still exist. And um, the Montana Human Rights um, Organization did a whole whole thing on them, and and I interviewed them the them and they gave me some more information but they uh but their goal was to basically get rid of ICWA and they're not alone they work with a coalition of groups including the Goldwater Institute the the Koch brothers you know a lot of republican leadership and uh and they have been trying to to find cases and 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 um and I've been invited to write a follow up on the Goldwater on the uh the Goldwater Institute ICWA connection and I've been working on that and um but they uh and they and basically trying to bring down ICWA, right? And you've seen a lot of these test cases in the news and stuff. And the Indian Child Welfare Act protects our kids, keeps our kids from being out adopted. I mean, I would explain this like, well, what if one day France woke up and found 30% of its children were being removed to other countries, right? They would say something about it, you know. And 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 under the Geneva Con Convention on Genocide, you know, this this amounts to ethnic cleansing. This is how they get rid of an und undesirable ethnic group is to take their children from them. And this has been happening for, you know, forever at a, at a very high rate for Native um, communities. And I think the 19th, when the law was passed in 1978, there had been, it was in response to a congressional report, which found that 25 to 35 percent of all Native children were being out adopted, right? And so, um, so w what my point is that when you don't have firm political boundaries, you do not, you can't protect your children. You can't protect your language. You can't protect your identity, right? You, none of it is protected. And this is the whole point of hundreds of years of colonial and US law, right? To make the outlines of our identity so fuzzy that anybody can come and take it. Anybody can take our children. Anybody can take our language. You know, it's hard for us to, to transmit things. I mean, it's, um, I actually, the language aspect I kind of came to because 
um, my husband, his, his mother is, um, is from Six Nations, she's Mohawk and Seneca, but his father is Finnish and Irish, right? And so uh, I, his, we, we, we got to know his Finnish grandmother before she died, and she was raised in Waukegan, Illinois, in a Finnish American community. And she told us that uh, she, her father and his generation were very insistent that they learn the language and they learn how to read and write in it, even though they were in Illinois. And so he, she explained her reason was that it was because when Finland declared its independence in the 1800s, they didn't know their own language anymore because they had been colonized by Sweden. So they had to write their Declaration of Independence in Swedish, right? And so for his generation, reclaiming their language was a huge thing. And that language reclamation only happened in the context of strong borders and, and political independence, right? So, you know, strong, fen you know, good fences make good neighbors, I think is the terminology. And, uh, and you know, when you compare it to Irish, they are in Ireland, you know, they're still trying to get back Gaelic. They haven't successfully done that yet. And, and they have had a longer period of more intense colonization and incursion into their, into their island from England um, than I think Sweden did with Finland. And so, um, but it's, uh, it gives you a sense that what we're experiencing is not unique. It's, it's, it happens any time that you were colonized, any time that you have an intrusive power trying to nip at the edges of your identity and make you go away because you are inconvenient. Right. Pretendianism, masketry, stereotypes, all these things are an extension of that colonial impulse to just to make us disappear. And so we need a structural solution. Right. And, and looking at the baby Veronica case, I really began to see some structural elements to this issue. And so here we had to take this case to the Supreme Court of the United States, right, a foreign court basically, right? And, and of course, you know, you have sort of Chief uh, uh, um, Justice Sotomayor, three times, if you read the record, she had to explain to the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts and um, Antonin Scalia, that uh, three times that Cherokee Nation does not use blood quantum. They only use, you know, descendancy. You have to have someone on the rolls, right? And she had, she had to explain that over and over and over again to them. And they just never sunk in. And I think I mentioned on the show before that Antonin Scalia allegedly said that he didn't know Indian federal law. He just made it up as he went along. And this is someone who actually advocated for sovereignty for a Catholic sect called Opus Dei, but would not recognize sovereignty for tribes in this country. Right. And so anyway, uh, so I, I was like, how? And I, and I heard that in, in the National Congress of American Indians was working on a Supreme, a kind of a Supreme Court project. So there had, even in 2013, there was some kind of movement going on that I don't, I haven't checked to see where that's at now, right? And so the, um, and so after, so I was like, so we need our own Supreme Court, right? And then, and then it gets to, well, then, you know, why, and then looking at the attacks on our sovereignty by this, these Christian groups and these Christian Republican coalition groups, right? And um, I found out that they were actually, they were actually, even in 2013, capitalizing on the disenrollment issue, right? They were saying that they were saying that people in tribes did not have a bill of rights, right? That they were vulnerable to having their citizenship taken away from them, from you know, uh, from just from jealousy. And this is all true. This is all true, right? But they were taking that and they were going to Republican fundraising dinners. And they were saying, we, there is one group of Americans in this country that is not protected by this, the, the Bill of Rights, and that is Americans living under these Indian governments that do not respect their rights. And they were using that as a talking point to raise money against us, to raise money to do things like this, do you know I mean? to take Indian children from their families. Right. And so it um, so they uh, um, so I was like, this is a real threat. And I, I was like, you know, in 2013, you know, uh, um, Obama, or no, yeah, Obama was still in office when this happened. But there was definitely this sense that the Republicans were organizing and and and, and maybe there was dawning another termination era, you know, which certainly Trump is is definitely considering, you know. And uh, and so I was thinking we need to actually protect ourselves from this. Uh, in a much more coherent way, right? 
And, uh, and we need to, one thing, we need to make sure that every tribe in this country has a Bill of Rights for its citizens. But we have, you know, several hundred uh, federally recognized and state recognized tribes. And how can we get each of them to pass a Bill of Rights, right? And, and particularly in tribes where, you know, because I was talking, I was interviewing disenrollees, and they were telling me that they actually were trying to seek um, some sort of justice from the federal government. But of course, they couldn't because that is about sovereignty. And so the federal government, the U.S. federal government, had no role in it. And so they were left, they were disenrolled, they couldn't appeal, you know, and, um, and sometimes this was just two families that didn't like each other, and the one would get in power and disenroll the other family, or it was about um, per caps, you know, people wanting more of the money and deciding to get rid of people so they have more per capita payments. You know, I mean, it's all of these things. Some of it was maybe legitimate, you know, maybe the person's, but I mean, it was also like, even if someone's great, great grandmother was from another band and got into this band, what does that really matter after 150 years? I mean, and so it's a, but, um, but they, you know, so all of these things were playing into it. And I was like, you know, there's no way to do this tribe by tribe. You know, this would actually take hundreds of years, maybe several hundred years to do, to get each tribe to pass a bill of rights, right? And, um, and so I realized that we need actually, and, and I was also reporting in 2013 on the Bakken oil field, and I was doing a lot of interviews with um, folks from Fort Berthold Reservation, tracking and talking about how they were trying to seek accountability from their tribe. They had, um, th their, uh, their chairman was uh, Tex, um, what's it, Tex Hall. He had a Tex red-tipped arrow hall, and he was later found... Um, kind of uh, involved with a, a murder for hire and the mafia. That was all you can check out the New York Times, you know, coverage of that. And you know, and and um, but he went before Congress and he said he was his whole thing was sovereignty by the barrel, sovereignty by the barrel of oil, right? And he was he went before Congress and he 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 said that because of sovereignty that they should have their own EPA with no oversight from the federal EPA. And then he proceeded to basically allow uranium fracking the fracking the oil from it creates uranium waste they have these socks that cover and they, these socks are irradiated and he was just dumping them anywhere on the reservation right and so there was so the, the i was interviewing these community you know um, grassroots folks who were tracking him some of them had mineral rights money and they were using that money to um, a couple of sisters, amazing sisters, and they were using, sitting at their kitchen table, using that to do the research. Ask, you know, they were really holding their tribal, their tribe to account. Do you know what I mean? And I was interviewing them, and and I was thinking like, you know, here we why and uh, and another one of my cousins was getting after me like, we don't have enough qualified people applying for jobs in the Navajo Nation. You need to come home and stuff. And I was like, you know, we need a federal government so that our own federal government. So we have something to go to for a Supreme Court, something we have to go to for a federal EPA, something to go for that would enforce our rights, even when our tribes um, do not, do you know what I mean? And um, something at another, and also I came to realize that, and I, I know that the term federal indigenous government sounds horrible, it sounds terrible, right? But I'm open to other names, obviously this is just a working idea, right? And so I, then I thought, that, you know, then that would actually, we'd have to negotiate, we'd be an archipelago, right? And we wouldn't just have to be tribes in the United States. We could also be in Canada, in Mexico. We could form like a, like the Iroquois Confederacy. You know, we could, we could confederate that way as indigenous people. And when we sent ambassadors to Washington, D.C., they would be seen by the president, do you know what I mean? And we would be able, negotiating flyover space and stuff would re, make our reality even more real to people. Our political reality, you know, and uh, and we would be able to negotiate a different relationship with the federal government, with with these different colonial governments, the Canadian government, the federal government, the Mexican government, right? And we would be able to advocate for our people much more strenuously, right? And so, and then we would also be able to make whole people, make whole people who have lost their tribal enrollment because of disenrollment. They could have a federal indigenous, you know, citizenship with a passport. We could help young people or children who have been um, adopted out, who don't have their access to their birth records, but who want to be made whole. We can, we can provide citizenship for what I call stateless indigenous people. Right? I call most of these people stateless indigenous people. That is a reference to the Holocaust 
after World War II, and the, a lot of Jewish people were stateless. They no longer were citizens of the countries in which they had, they had tried to commit genocide against them, right? And so we have a lot of stateless indigenous people in this country. I would love to see a study to kind of figure out how many, you know, um, and so there, how many there are. And um, so, but it's, uh, um, but yeah, so we, these, these folks who are, um, who are from tribes that have been so diminished by genocide or who, who do not have any form of recognition could be recognized by this federal indigenous government and also if, uh, could be given citizenship if they weren't unable to form a tribe of some sort. Um, and so it would be, so, and also that we could also naturalize people. We could allow people to become citizens of our, of our, of our country. And, um, and then we could, um, and that I think would let out some of the steam. A lot of the, the, a lot of people are Francophiles or Anglophiles. And I often point to T.S. Eliot, the poet, the American poet who became, who, who, who married a, into an English family. He was an Anglophile and then he became British, a British citizen. People, you know, that's a natural impulse. And I think that if we had a constructive way for it to be directed that still recognized our sovereignty, right, then it would be it would be harnessed in a way that was much more healthy, you know, not not, you know. And so I think that all of these things. So that was my idea was sort of this is my idea of a solution, you know, and, and, and it would uh, I think that our greater political reality would eliminate a lot of these problems of pretendianism. You know, they would eliminate a lot of the masketry because people would be forced to contend with a modern native nation in a very real way. And and then we would be much more prominent um, on, on every level. And and then, you know, it just and then we would be able to have more accountability. I would say that, you know, uh, like the um, gentleman I was interviewing said, I'm not doing violence. I'm not doing lateral violence here. I'm holding people accountable. Right. And and I think that that is to me really important. I mean, maybe it's not important to anybody else, but it is very important to me, you know, and, and I don't ask anybody to put themselves on the line for the work I'm doing or anything like that. You know, I, I made this choice and, um, and, you know, I feel pretty confident. I don't know, maybe that's wrong. And um, so I'm going to actually look at some of the comments. Um, so yeah, check out this piece. I did a lot of work on it. Um, this is him with his daughter. This is, um, uh, and, and I had different, oh, this is the woman that runs the Christian Alliance that was funding money to take the child away. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, it was, um, yeah, I, I have a lot of interesting ideas in here. I, I always suggest reading it. I actually have a quote in here. Um, I ended it with a quote from Vine Deloria Jr., who is my grandmother's first cousin. Um, he wrote, In Custer Died for Your Sins, an Indian manifesto. Um, so it is vitally important that the Indian people pick the intellectual arena as the one in which to wage war. Past events have shown that the Indian people have always been fooled about the intentions of the white man. Always we have discussed irrelevant issues while his, he has taken the land. Never have we taken the time to examine the premises upon which he operates so that we can manipulate him as he has us. And so I sort of ended the piece with that because I do think we have to think, do you know I mean? And, 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 and because these problems are structural, you know, we can look at these individual pretendians or, or descendants or other forms of exploiters, you know, um, even folks in our own community, and we can say that this is an individual problem, but it is not. There are no other people in the world that, that face this level of, of sort of um, appropriation of our existence as we do. It's, an, it's on a level that no other group of people experience. And why is that? And that has totally to do with our political reality or lack of it. And so I would really urge, um, you know, that, yeah, it's hard to get tribes to agree to stuff. But you know, if we're serious about this, this is, this is a suggestion. And I think it's, you know, and I, and I would love to see some debate about it, right? And, uh, and I think that this is, and you know, there's a huge, what, what this man also told me in the interview before he left, he was like, he said something quite moving. He said, um, let me see, um, where did he say? He said uh, that, uh, you know, he makes things, in the, he makes traditional things and in, in, in food in the, in the community and people, when he says that, you know, that people like the things we do for them, um, but they want to use his culture as a fashion show 
and that and it's um and also that they he says that they hate indian men i don't know it's but it's uh hurt it hurts hurt and painful it makes us want to kill ourselves and use drugs any moment we could be thrown under the bus you know it's um i think that the level of suffering that this kind of exploitation wages on us is 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 something that i i can't i can't allow i can i can try to stop do you know what i mean and i mean with the um with the uh with with Rebecca Parrish, um, Roanhorse, um, you know the use of our traditional stories that way. Our holy people. Um, I really don't. I can't even imagine any Navajo grandparent being okay with that. That would be hard to imagine. And um, and I heard. I just heard that they are actually scouting um, sort of uh, uh, places on the Navajo na Nation to shoot a movie. To, it has. It has. She has a film option for it. So it's not something that's going away or something that's she's making, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm not even really concerned about the money she's making off of it. What I'm concerned about is the way in which something so central to who we are, our relationship to the holy people is being exploited, right? And it's the taking of it without permission. And then now she's, you know, busy marshalling people to to label Navajo writers, not just myself, but many others and other Native writers who stand up as anti-Black, and saying that because and we, we have I, I was a huge supporter of hers. You can look on Twitter. I was in 2018 up until July, happily retweeting her book and supporting her, and um, and and I went to her privately first and talked to her about it, and, and you know. I actually will publish um, my part of the conversation that I gave with her so you can see how I spoke to her. I will only summarize her responses because of course that's a personal conversation, but I give myself permission to, to, to uh, share my own, my own words. And, um, but, uh, but it's, uh, you know, I think when we think of these things, you know, um, like, like our experiences, our family experiences, you know how we how our how our families have experienced all of these sufferings you know i um you know and we have people you know um like um you know we have people claiming them you know and 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 i think this gentleman brought up a great point which is that you know if they don't that's taking a long time to vote um you know if they don't actually have those experiences but they're benefiting in some way it kind of makes everything that we've gone through meaningless. You know, I talk a lot about, um, you know, um, well, this is a piece I wrote uh, a long time ago, which is about uh, the impeachment of um, of uh, Cecilia Fire Thunder for um, her, her stance on abortion rights um, in South Dakota. Um, and, you know, I think to me, these issues mean a lot because I am a Native woman and my daughter is Native, you know, and, and we actually... One of the things I want he, he he actually pointed out was that, and I think is very important with the database issue and and with the book, um, is that, you know, what what the what the database is supposed to to, to identify for for people. And we're gonna look. We're gonna do. I've done several several hours of interviews with former people who worked with um, Anita Lucchesi, and I'm going to be putting. I'm going to be doing a piece that really looks at the database and how it's managed. And so. Um, but, uh, you know, we need, um, the, and like I pointed out at the end of the episode last time, that if the factors that led to her trafficking, they had really nothing to do with, with what, what our people face in our communities. Do you know what I mean? And, uh, and what makes our young women and, and, and mothers and, and makes them vulnerable to trafficking. It's not the same. And what, we, what the database is supposed to do is help to... Um, to provide, you know, follow up, to provide, you know, um, to allow communities to become active, and to and to allow accountability and re and, and all this stuff, and and also to look at to to change the factors on the ground. And if your family is not impacted by the policies and that created these these factors, then it's not the same thing. It's actually and you know to speak for us and to present for us as a native woman who has. You know, then it, it, it's just completely different. You know, um, a white, a, a daughter of a white family, a wealthy white family, what would lead her into trafficking is just so different than what our people are experiencing. We need these systemic issues addressed, and they have to be authentically um, portrayed. I have no problem with someone who is of 
whatever dissent advocating for us, but I think that they have to be, and they don't need to be of any dissent at all to do the work, to, to be our allies, to be our accomplices, you know, but they do need to be honest, they need to be authentic, and they need to be accountable, you know, and, um, and so that's, um, that's where I come on that. I, um, I, I wanted to end with, um, with a, um, you know, I actually, I finished my manuscript on Monday, and, and I've been thinking a lot about the ending, and, and, uh, and I actually, um, I utilized um, an interview that I, I did in 2017 uh, in my book, as you know, um, let's see if I can, if it's there or not. Um, my book uh, compares, um, do I have it here? It was here. Anyway, um, my book compares uh, the, um, let's see here, let's see. Anyway, I'm not seeing it right. Oh, there it is. So, um, there it is. So my book, um, my book actually compares uh, these two different takeovers. Um, the Bundy takeover, um, particularly at Malheur, which I covered here in Oregon as a journalist, you know, particularly from the perspective of the Burns Paiute tribe, and then I also of Standing Rock. And and uh, my grandmother's family, her grandparents, you know, lived on Standing Rock for 40 years, even though they're Yankton Sioux. And um, and so you know, her and her cousins have, and her 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 her, her the um, the aunts and uncles and, and folks have a lot of ties to actually um, the community of Wakpala on Standing Rock. And so, and, um, but the, um, so I grew up hearing a lot of stories about Standing Rock, actually from Standing Rock, um, and uh, particularly about the community of Wakpala. And, and these stories, you know, when you get these oral stories as a child, they're part of who you are, you know. And there's one story that's in my family, which I recount in the book, um, which is about Sitting Bull, right? I am. I guess related to him through a niece who married um, that Frenchman whose picture I just showed. She was a niece of Sitting Bull, and so I'm related through him that way, not direct descent. Um, but um, but uh, um, it's a uh, uh, the story. The way it was told to me is that this is a story that came to our family, and it's from sitting from the Hupapa people. And uh, and in the story, uh, there was a young woman, right? And I, I do recount the story in my blog as well. But there was a young woman, uh, who uh, a young girl, really, and her she had an older sister, and her older sister had uh, had two children, and in the in the traditional Lakota way, you're supposed to space your children four years apart, right? It was really frowned upon, and in fact, if you were the older child who was um, who was uh, born, um, you know, with a very closely you know spaced sibling, they would call that older child a killed child. Right. And because they said that they, they would chastise the parents and say that the child was not loved. So they wanted to immediately replace the child. So there's a lot of shame involved with having children too closely spaced apart. The opposite of that is a beloved child, you know, where they you, you get the right to you do the ceremony and you get the right to wear the red ochre and your hair part, you know, and this would be a, this would be the exact opposite. This would be a child who was beloved and could wear that even in old age and people would know how their family regarded them, you know, but, you know, it was very shameful to be a killed child, right? And so anyway, there was this grandmother who on Standing Rock and she, um, she walked with a limp, right? And my grandma's cousin was being, was raised by his grandparents. His name was Tipi Sapa. And um, uh, my, my great grandma's name was Hakikicha Tawi. And so they're uh, the Reverend PJ Deloria and Mary Sully. And he, um, and he saw the grandma walking with a limp. And every time she walked, she'd go, whoo, you know, she'd go, when she'd get up, she'd go, whoo, whoo, ha, you know, that's kind of thing. And she would, and he asked, like, what, what happened to her? And, you know, in our culture, that's, it's pretty impolite to do things like that, to ask questions like that. But his grandfather took pity on him and he was like, okay, you know, you shouldn't ask questions like that. But, you know, you know, I will tell you this one time, you know, and what he told him was that she had been a young girl. And when the Pete, when, when Sitting Bull's band were fleeing, when they were fleeing north to Canada, right. And, uh, and she had been shot in the leg, right. She was like 13, 14. And she had an older sister who had two babies and, and the older sister could carry only the infant, right. She had also like a two or three year old. And so the, the younger sister, Carrie, who had the bullet shot in her leg, she carried her, her niece and carried her all the way to Canada, right? And, and when they got to Canada, Sitting Bull 
The first thing he did, he didn't honor the warriors, he honored her. And he put her on a bed of sage, sorry. And he honored her and he said, and he gave her her name and, you know, um, dependable woman. And, and, and that's why she had that limp. And, and I think that these family stories that we have, and how they're told to us, and what, what they tell us about our own people are so valuable. And I don't think that they should be mimicked, right? I don't think that anyone can construct an identity that is anything like that. And, you know, I, you know, there, we, when we, when even the way the story was told to me, I learned, I was taught about how to behave, what the protocols are, how to treat people, how to honor other, you know, to make sure that you make, tell people that this, we got this from the whole papa, this is not our Ihang Dewan story, you know, all these little things that you're taught, and, you know, and like things I taught was papa, my, you know, just through observing and being with my Navajo grandparents, you know, no one can copy that. No one can take shortcuts. And the world deserves to know about this. The world deserves to know what we think, how we think, how we are, you know, and because it's, it's, it's a form of wealth in the world, how human beings, the things, how they interact, how we interact with, with our mother, you know, everything that comes out of that as a people. And I really think, sorry, I really, really think that <clears throat> that, uh, that, that will actually save the world. I think that um, what's coming forth now, even with the fight over the how we treat the holy people, you know, I almost feel sometimes like me and uh, Rebecca are in some kind of dance together, like a sacred dance, do you know what I mean? And she's pushing this forward, and we're going to have a national discussion about the holy people for, with America for the first time, you know what I mean? We're going to talk about what that means, and that way people are going to have a great understanding about what it is to be an indigenous person. And, you know, in my book, I give a definition of indigenous people. And, and I actually got it from, um, from Vine, from Uncle Vine. And I, uh, and it's, and his definition is, is, you know, a people who, uh, indigenous people are with a capital P, um, have an origin story based in a meeting with a sacred being who is a manifestation of land itself. And in that meeting, you make agreements, right? There are agreements made, and 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 then you live out those agreements, right? And you also given you know gifts like you know the changupa, you know sacred songs, ceremonies. You know in the Navajo way, you're given the corn by the we were given the nadan by the holy people, you know by the dinnya. And so, this is all what makes us a people, and we're a people of a specific area. You know, for my dad's people, it would be the people of the Great Plains. For my mother's people, it's between the four sacred mountains and the four sacred rivers, the Dine, Dinepikeya, or the Dineta. And so these things are what make us who we are. And, and these agreements we made, they, they define how we interact with the land, with the world. And, 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 and it's, I think that the understanding that is really crucial. And understanding and respecting our stories is crucial, you know. And, and these two women are using our stories or trying to use them in different ways without our permission, you know, and, and, and to speak for us. Right. And it's um, it's not it's it, it, that's that's just the same old colonialism that we've ever have always experienced. It's not it's nothing new. Right. It's not changing things. And um, and so, you know, confronting that has, you know, is challenging. But, you know, I I feel it's. I feel it's the right thing to do, you know, and I think, um, and I will listen to your, to you, if you call me and you give me an interview, I will respect you. I will respect, you know, your life, your anonymity, if necessary, if you want to go on the record, that's great publicly. And, um, but we need to hold, we need accountability and, 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 you know, other people don't have to stand up if they, if it would hurt them too much, hurt their career, whatever. I, I will stand up. And I'm fine with that, Jimmy. And I've been through the rigmarole on Twitter and places like that before I survived, you know. And I think that some of that will be later looked at in the history books as sort of this is the kind of corrosive negative effect, toxicity that pretendianism brought to Indian people that would be visible. You could actually read it and see it, Jimmy. And so a lot of those tweets will be a, a documentation of that oppression that we faced. 
you know, um, I think that having people in our in our most space, most important spaces, whether we're talking about stories about our holy people, or we're talking about MIW dealing with the trauma and the pain of that, um, having people who are who are exploiting that in those spaces and monitoring us and 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 trying to 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 keep control of us, that is that is the worst sort of trauma and pain. That's just more of it. That's just more of the the of the colonialism that's more of what leads to a lot of the other trauma on the reservation like this man feeling that he wants to kill himself because of this right it's it, it's it just leads to despair and and we need to stop you know we need to stop it and um there's nothing wrong with accountability you know i think studies have shown that um that you know cities that have more than one newspaper attract more um investment because people have more confidence in the institutions so holding our organizations accountable only makes them stronger. And it only will mean that we will have more investment in them because people will be more confident in them, right? So this is a good process. This isn't a negative process. And, and I guess I'd like to end with how I ended the book, um, uh, the last part I wrote. And I, 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 the reason why I went, I was so late on, on Monday doing the show about Rebecca Roanhorse Parish I, um, I, it was because I, I finished my manuscript first. I wanted to get that done first. And, um, and I ended it with an interview that I had done, uh, in 2017, July, 2017 with, um, the former chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, um, uh, uh, Dave, um, Dave Archambo the second. And I, um, and I, I was able to get a two hour interview with him in his offices before he left office. He was voted out. He lost by 30 votes, I think. And, um, and I, I talked to him and I didn't know what he was going to say or anything. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I kind of talked to him before a bit, not that for that long before. And it was really interesting. He actually talked he, and I, and I was going over the transcript, checking it again, um, just, you know, over the weekend and I listening very carefully to it, you know, a two hour interview and I heard things in it that I had not, I'd forgotten about. And one was that he was talking about how he had this stone, right, this stone, and it was given to him by Wensler Nosy, no, Nosy, I might be mispronouncing that, from the Apache stronghold uh, in Oaks Flat. And he said that Wensler was one of the first tribal leaders to come up to Stanley Rock and to voice his support in person, right? And he gave, um, he gave, uh, um, he gave him that stone, right? And it was from one of their sacred mountains. And he, um, he said that he carried that stone throughout standing the whole thing. He had that with him. It was literally a touchstone for him. And one time he lost it and he was frantically searching for it. And then, uh, and then, and then he finally did lose it. And then he called Wensler and Wensler was like, you know, if you lost that stone, it did, it did something for you. It, it, it's helped you in some way and it's done. And then he said, but if that stone breaks, then that means that it, it, it saved your life, you know? And, um, and so he, um, Funnily enough, he wasn't really on social media, so he didn't know people were calling him Dapple Dave and all that stuff. And, uh, and until he got a phone call from a university, and that uh, Cornell University that said that they were going to assign him security because there had been death threats against him. And so he was like, what? And he was very unaware of what was going on. And so uh, he then Wensler called him and asked him to come to, to uh, Apache Stronghold for a ceremony. So he went down there and... Uh, when he got there, uh, he went into a sweat, and he said it was super, really hot, really hard, and he, um, and then he, uh, and and then they they let people go out, and he went out, and and there was a white man waiting for him there, and and that white man was like, I have a YouTube channel with four million views, you know, I can get you an interview on there. I was the one that live streamed at Backwater Bridge and all this stuff, and he's like, okay, 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 and he goes back into the sweat, and then later he sees Wensler. And Wensler says, you know, that was a hard sweat, wasn't it? And he was like, yeah. He's like, that's because evil was waiting outside, you know, and evil couldn't come in. So evil wanted, was trying to force the people out. And he, and he says, and when you went outside, evil spoke to you, didn't it? And, and, and for Dave, he never thought about it that way. He was like, that's, I've never thought about, I think that's kind of an Athabascan way of thinking about things, you know, the fact Navajo, you know, you push, you, you send evil, you send it back at, you send it back at it, you, 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 you go back. I don't think that Lakota people think about witchcraft or anything like that as much. And so it was kind of a foreign concept to him, you know, 
And, um, and so, and then, you know, and he was talking about how that stone, how, uh, when he first became chairman, his uncle had given him a stone as well. And, and he was talking about how, you know, uh, in our culture, in Lakota culture, there is, you know, the story about, well, he wasn't talking, but I thought about it when he was talking about the stone and the eon, you know, that it, it was originally soft and fluid and, and then, but it gave all that up and became hard and still to create life, you know, to create our blood, to create the water, everything in the world, you know, to create our earth. And that, um, and that we owe all this to the stone, you know, Eon. And you saw I had written that piece about Stone Boy. He's one of our cultural heroes, um, Eon, Eon Hokushino, Eon Hokushino. And so it's, um, but, uh, it, and, uh, and so, so, and he was talking about how, you know, how the stone, the water, you know, water's like mini wachoni, mini wachoni wakhan, you know, that's sacred, you know. And it's, uh, you know, and he was, you know, saying how like, in the sweat lodge, of course, you put the, the water on the stone and then you bring the stone back to life again. You give it back what it gave to all of us. And then of course your prayers go up, right? And um, and he was talking about how, you know, they move every 28 days, they go and do these ceremonies, you know, to Peshla, to the Black Hills, to all these places. And it's all across the sacred land. The landscape is sacred that we live on. This is our relation to as indigenous people. You know, it's a sacred landscape and our experience and our role and our life with it is sacred. And this is the part I think that could save the world, particularly when we're talking about climate change and capitalism, right? And um, and this is the, maybe the gift that we have to give right now that we need to put into the minds of the larger world, like we gave democracy, like we gave women's rights. This is another thing that we're getting ready to give, right? And um, and then he was and, and I was thinking about that, and, and of course you know the Navajo way is the same. You know the holy people, our ceremonies are the um, our ceremonies are based on the stories of the holy people, what they did, the stories, right? And how they did it. And it's across the landscape of the Denefikeya, of, of our sacred landscape. And every part of the Navajo Nation you go to, they, they, people can tell you stories about what happened there. It's it's a place populated by these stories. And, and you know, with a, the, this is a monster that was killed here. This is this. What we're dealing with are monsters. These are monsters like what? what, the, uh, what the, the, the twins took on. This is the exact same thing, you know? And so, you know, these things, yeah, I mean, and I think these things have power. I think they have power. I think that, you know, it's not required for me to necessarily fight for the holy people. I think that they, I, what I'm doing is I'm warning, you know, this is a, you don't mess with these things. And, 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 and the, but these things have their own power, you know? And I think that what we're seeing is that power emerging again. And, and I think, and this, so this is, the basis of what I do, you know, and, and I, and I do want to see wholeness, but I think that we need to analyze it. We need to do, as Vine said, fight these things into the intellectual realm as well. And, and think, think about it, think about what's happening, what's going on and how it's happening. You know, we can't just be, you know, I mean, if there are no standards and anyone can be native, how does that help us really? Does it help us? Who does it help? You know, so I'm going to look at some of the comments and then um, let me actually um, I think I'll put up the. Uh, oh, here's my. Um, it's my <laughs> piece on Stone Boy. Um, it's uh, um, since we're talking about him, the in 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 Lakota and Dakota culture, we have these stories called a hunkakas, and they are told to children at night before they they go to sleep, and it's a way of putting these ideas in their minds. These these moral ideas and these thoughts and and so these uh, hunkakas are um, are um, things and so I wrote this piece about um, the Black Hills and Stone Boy and kind of comparing the same thing actually talking about these how there's this mapping of sacred sites in the Black Hills to some of these stories and to our us, you know astronomy and anyway I was a, I was a, it's sort of it's I really had to work hard after I left academia to regain my voice and to write and speak in a way that wasn't academic ease. You know, and that was like a big challenge of mine. And um, being in, um, at the Pacific News Service as an editor was a wick, fast way to regain my own voice, <laughs> having to write a piece every day. And so, um, but uh, yeah, so I'm going to look at some of the comments right now and um, see what people have to say here. Uh, and then I'm going to um, end this and, and I will do more as far as, you know, discussing different things. And we'll I'll write something um, kind of thoughtful about what's been happening. I will. And then we will be doing an actual 
publishing, um, we will be publishing, uh, you know, a, an examination of how the MIW database is managed. Um, and we will also be, uh, I'm working um, with a partner, with a media partner to uh, have a, a, gene a professional genealogist go through uh, Rebecca um, Parrish's uh, family tree and, and then we're going to publish it. And, and I understand there is a New York Times article that will be, is also in the works looking at her, her family. Her, um, and that and so those are all still coming up and um, and so and I also will be uh, trying to figure out if the if the film um, when what the date line of the production of the film based on her book is going to be and also I did find out that she has actually written a book about um, where the character is a descendant of a Spanish conquistador so uh, that has happened I didn't know that so um, but um, but yeah this is um, sort of what we're looking at let me um, see if we look at some of these questions um, okay, Joe Kelly. <laughs> what native writer doesn't know about relocation and the tribal termination policies of the 20th century, including forced sterilization of women in Aisha's hospital? Yeah, good question. I should say that's uh, who, um, and then Chish says, who doesn't know that every nation has their own standard? Yeah, and you know, I mean, I don't agree with blood quantum, but I don't have a say about what tribes do. These are the, their sovereign nations. You know, and I, I mean, I've never had a try, neither the Navajo Nation has not put its blood quantum to a vote, but I definitely am going to spend my life working on trying to change that. I think, um, you know, I, I think that blood quantum is divisive. It's, I think it, it's, um, it, it's, I mean, imagine if the United States actually uh, required that every, to have citizenship, everyone had to have a certain percentage of, uh, of, uh, of revolutionary war blood. Right, you had to have a revolutionary war ancestor. It would because what are what are blood quantum's? But they're they're a snapshot in history, you know, of, of our people at a certain point. So my looking at someone's family tree is not about blood quantum. It's about is there the relationship to our communities that they say there is. That's what we're looking at, um, particularly if they are presenting themselves as a Cheyenne woman. Well, where is the relationship? When what form does it take? Do you know I mean, or they are presenting themselves as, I mean, as recently as um, the in uh, just last week, uh, Rebecca Parrish ha was on um, a radio show uh, talking about how she was half black and half a okay a wingé, which is setting a very high standard. Which means that she she's not saying I'm of some vague native descent somewhere in my family tree. She's saying she's okay a wingé. So that means that her mother has a very concrete relationship with the tribe. Um, which is nowhere seen. We looked, you know, very closely at the um, four generations. There's no ties at all. And so, um, all right, let me see here. Yes, you have been seriously with that too with people just wanting to strive to cover it up. I know that people, and I see a comment here brought up about, you know, um, about um, Anita's stories of trauma and of trafficking, and I respect those. I'm not questioning those, but I'm saying that, you know, those are not factors. What caused her trauma and suffering doesn't is not really relevant to the discussion of MIW because they are not caused by the factors that cause increased trafficking and, and abuse of Native and murder of Native women. There's no correlation between what she's experiencing because she because there's not so she's she her story is sort of it, like any um, person who is an ally they come with their stories they come with their life experiences but their job is to help us to help make sure that our stories and our and our issues are addressed and to do it in a way that's ethical that's honest that is accountable that is um, effective and and so that's the process that's happening here is the process of accountability and she has centered her stories in such a way uh, that it requires, uh, I'm not at all challenging her suffering at all, but I'm saying that it is not the same as what cause, what are the factors that cause these things, um, MIW itself. That is not the case. All right. All right. She says, "I feel you about the language. We got to hold it down." That's true. And that sounds pretty funny. 
I think I guess uh, Scalia was the worst. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then, oh, this is weird. I didn't know this. What's this one here? Okay. She says that um, Republican conservatives like to call us scans, special interest groups. Wow. Yeah, they would like to reduce us to that. So um, let me see here. And um, Angela Bibbin says, uh, the Goldwater Institute has shown up at Iniqua cases in Colorado where I practice. The recent Brackeen case was another opportunity for them to attempt to undo not just Iqua, but the entire canon of federal Indian law. Thankfully, they failed. They will definitely keep up the hunt until they find, uh, let's see, until they find the right set of facts and circumstances to mount another attack. That's so true. The Brackeen case is what I was thinking of. Um, oh, this is too funny. I don't know if I could post that, but... Um, um, let me see. Oh, actually, let me just love to for your people. It's accountability and action. I like that. It's a really good one. And this one is um, what Deloria lineage represent? Yeah, it's uh, my um, my grandmother's cousins are um, Vine and Sam Deloria, and um, she actually doesn't have a lot of cousins now. That I think about it. Um, it's weird. Uh, they. Um, so, uh, but, um, but yeah, they're her cousins and Barbara and, um, Deloria, those are all her cousins. They, you know, um, Mary Sully is the grandmother of us all, you know, we're all her descendants. We all came out of her womb, <laughs> in a sense. So that's who, um, how we're all related. So, um, she's, let me see her, I'm going to find some, um, all right, let me see. All right, let's see. In what way was she unethical? So, uh, you know, I think that um, we're going to look at how the database has been managed. I think that um, falsely representing who you are um, is is really damaging. I think that, um, you know, like I said before, when I imagined the MIW issue, and I, and I knew that I, I wanted it someday, when I started covering the MIW issue, when I covered the Olivia Lone Bear case, um, uh, it's, uh, I, I was hoping that we would get more attention for it as they have in, in Canada, right? But, uh, which is, which has a much, the, the MIW issue there is, has much longer term, you know, they've been doing it for over 20 years, um, and it has much deeper roots, uh, as a movement, I should say, not as a, as, as a, as a, as an epidemic, but, um, but it, uh, but I never thought that someone would center themselves in the way this has happened and sort of just, draw all the attention. I never foresaw that happening. And, and that person has to have a level of accountability. That's just how it is. Otherwise, you know, I mean, I don't understand no accountability. It's so strange. I mean, what? I don't even get it, you know. So uh, I haven't seen, um, I saw one person, you know, trying to make, I mean, we're going to be doing a lot of work on um, the, we have a lot of interviews that we've done. And if anyone wants to contact me with more information about how they've seen or interacted with Anita Lucchese, particularly the management of the database, let me know. We actually spoke, I talked to one of her staffers and uh, she told me that, that no one has, that nobody has seen the database. It's a black box. You're not allowed to see it. There's no access to it. We don't even know what's in it. We don't even know if it's any good. <laughs> Literally, I mean, we don't know. We have no idea. And so that, there's like zero accountability happening there. And so, um, you know, I think, um, that's uh, we need to know. We need to know and and how it's managed. So we're going to do a really in depth piece on that and look at that and um, and and see. So let me see. Um, okay. Oh, how and when will your book article be available? Okay, uh, standoff will be available in March. I guess we're um, doing the edits right now and stuff. So. Um, and, uh, and you can get it uh, through my publisher, Tory House, or it's also, um, that picture was taken from Amazon. It will be on a lot of sites, so. Um, okay, let's see if I can find. So, um, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's too funny. Okay, um, yeah, so well, I, I, think that, I think that's about, let's see, let me, uh, oh, let's see what she's saying. Having a killed, we don't have a killed child concept, but we put way too much responsibility on our firstborn girls. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. So that, um, that was, I mean, I think that's when you're, when you're, when you're talking internally with your family with oral stories, these are the things you learn. 
by talking to them. Um, one of my issues with what Anita is doing is that um, there are concerns about the report that came out at the federal level recently and the way the family stories were used. And I was also, well, one, I think I mentioned that about that young man who had his mother's story shared and he became suicidal. He tried to commit suicide because she didn't ask permission. And I just heard that in my dad's community that she came there and she read off the names of the MIW. And it, it was, you have to know the protocol for doing things. Um, and that has to be done in ceremony. And it was very traumatizing to the community. And some of them, they just start crying and it wasn't done in the right way, you know? And, um, and so she didn't know to ask what the protocol is in that community. And um, I know at Yakima too, you have to wait a year to say their names. And, um, and then, um, yeah, and then the issue of, of, of you know, I, I was also told that she's offering a special service to sell access to these stories for money. And, and I think that that is, um, that is troubling. I think um, without accountability, these sorts of actions um, really are, are, are basically um, exploitation. And um, so, and yeah, so I think that's what we're really, really going to look at in the reporting. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I'm not seeing um, any more here. So, and uh, definitely, uh, you know, let me know. Um, so, um, um, if you have any, um, any more, um, Ricardo says, thank you for covering the subject. It's a fresh breast they're talking about. And uh, the guy that called me before I came on air, he said, um, he said that, um, that basically um, uh, he thanked me for um, doing that and, and doing the fight. And, and I am, um, oops, I don't want to show that. I'll just go back over here. Um, so that, um, well, thank you all very much. And I really enjoy, I don't know if I, I have never really represented, presented this idea about a federal indigenous government before, but I wanted to let you know that I'm not just trying to cut people out or use some outdated colonial system to, to make pe some people Indian, some people not. That's not what this is about. This is about that there has to be a standard. There has to be accountability. There has to be um, something. Um, because really the opposite is, is basically the political disappearance of our people. And that is the goal of colonialism. That is the goal of it. And so we uh, need to be thinking, as mine said, we need to be intellectual about this process. We need to have and we need to have a plan. And this is my idea. And I, I, I just throw it out there as sort of a beginning. And I encourage other people to, to engage with it and to let me know, what, you know, I'm sure that people have really great ideas. They probably have a much better name for it than I just gave you. And so, but I, I think that would be really amazing. We would, we would have a lot of relief from a lot of the kind of um, exploitation we face now it would give us a space to be our own people, just like the Finns were able to recover their language, language that gives you a space to be your own people again and to, to take com command of it. And, um, and so that's my other thing. And, and I will be um, doing some more reports and uh, reporting. And also I'm also doing some more writing too. I'm actually working on finishing my novel, and, um, which is called Leading the Glittering World. And um, it's all about um, the atomic age, nuclear power, and Kenwick Man. So it's uh, interesting and, and so I'm not trying to, um, so it's, yeah, I've been, I wrote, I wrote it years ago and I'm finishing it up now. So I'm, and I'm really looking forward to it. And I also wrote a historical novel set on my father's reservation called The uh, Chalk Rock Colony, which is about a worker's colony that my, my grandma's generation started. Uh, young Yanktons got together, built their own factory, built their own houses. All these things that we talk about wanting to do, they did it. And so it's all about, it's, it's set there. And so it's, it's an interesting historical novel. I had a lot of fun writing it. Although I was a little very nervous because the main character is a man and I had a hard time, you know, feeling like I was, I could do that voice. <laughs> a man raised in the early 20th century, uh, a Yankton man. And so, but I, I feel much more comfortable. I feel more, I mean, I'm older now. I feel way more mature. And um, I, I wrote those novels when my children were very small and I was home and I um, started an MFA program at Pacific University. And so um, I'm finishing them now and I'm just in a different place now and I feel really good about it. And so uh, I encourage you all to do self-care, to, uh, to love each other, uh, to, you know, we do this work and we don't do it alone. You know, um, we are a part of, of, of a history of people, of a people, um, each of you, your respective peoples and, and, and everything that your people brought with you 
all that medicine that's there with you when you do these things, when you take these scans. So, um, but you know, I, I, I take this scan now and, and, um, and, and I don't encourage other people to stand up if they are vulnerable, you know, you know, I will just, you know, I'll take the heat. It's okay. All right. Thank you all. Yeah. Um, whoopee da.